the campaign that you've got going at the moment mm -hmm. is I Way on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with Ai Weiwei. Um, no, no, it's the bane <laughs> of my existence. <laughs> so what, what is it? Uh, so Ai Wei is a campaign that I started sort of by accident. It was very natural. Um, in order to change the way in which we value women, to change the conversation around how we define our worth, women's worth. Not just women, it's for men as well, but let's be honest, women are way more under attack than men, especially when it comes to our aesthetic. That is how we are valued so much more so than men are. Um, you can turn on any TV or open any magazine in order to see that. Uh, it started because I saw an Instagram post that had all these numbers written across the bodies of a group shot of the Kardashians. And um, I looked at it at a glance and I thought, oh God, but that's how much they're worth. But that's their net worth, that's how much money they're worth. And I clicked on it and it was their weight. And whatever you might think, whatever I might think about the Kardashians, these are six women who've built an empire and they are business women alongside everything else that they are. It is so insane that after in 2018, we are still writing down their weight on every, across every single woman's body. And then the comment underneath this post, which is followed by half a million people at least, all of whom are young girls, was, uh, this is how much they weigh. Who do you think looks like they weigh the least? What do you weigh? And there were thousands of comments from young girls being like, oh no, I'm the same height as them, but I weigh this much. Oh no, I'm too fat, I'm awful. All this, that, these comments of constant, constant self-hatred. And then because of the algorithms of Instagram, the more I, when, once I'd clicked on that, more of those sort of posts started to come up on my feed constantly. And then weight loss posts, and then more and more things that were just, clearly describing a woman's entire worth centered around her weight. So I decided to write what I weigh on Instagram, which is the fact that I am financially independent, my wonderful relationship, my incredible friends, the job that I have, the fact that I get to laugh every day, and alongside a lot of the things that aren't perfect about my life. All these things make up who I am. That is how we define men. That has now got to be how we define women. And people joined in. So, I mean, did it was- the same thing. I didn't ask anyone to, but people volunteered thousands of posts, so many that I had to start an Instagram account in order to make sure that they didn't just come and go, that they would have somewhere. We almost kind of turned it into a museum of self-love. And it has now grown and grown and grown, and we have over 100,000 followers, and this has been in just a couple of months without any real like celebrity endorsement or anything. It's just organically grown out of women's desire, women and some men's desire, to finally be recognized for who they are rather than just what they look like and whether or not they fit into society's like extremely narrative constructs as to what is definitively acceptable. Given the, given the, the tidal wave mm. of everything in opposition to that mm -hmm. on, on, on Instagram, what yeah. do you think you can achieve? I think just shaking people and waking them up for a minute and being the voice that spoke out against it was a start because I think a lot of people are now, what I've been seeing in messages is a lot of people have sort of, it's been almost like a glass of cold water in the, in the face of constant like this. It feels like women are being bombarded with hatred, with self-hatred, and we are encouraged to hate ourselves and hate the way that we look and criticize ourselves and think about our aesthetic all day long. And I think that it, it took someone in this position Kind of, I'm kind of like a Trojan horse. It took someone who's in this position, right in the middle of it, just to say, what are we doing? And just to be thought provoking about it and be like, think about how often, how many times a day do you think about the things that are wrong with the way that you look? How much of that time? It would be amazing if we had an app. I will say this, they have these apps now that monitor how long you spend on social media. An app on your phone that tells you how much time of your day you spend using social media. Wouldn't it be amazing to have an app that monitored how much of your time you spend thinking about your looks? And what would happen in the world if we would apply that time to thinking about the growth of our family or our career or our happiness and well-being and mental health? Do you think twas ever thus or is it, has it got worse? And if it's got worse, how? I mean... I think it's definitely gotten worse. You know, I grew up in the 90s, which was a really toxic time to be a young girl because hip bones were seen as a badge of honour and heroin chic was used non-ironically by the highest of publications that... The, it was bandied around everywhere. You had Kate Moss and Jodie Kidd and all these like supermodels being glorified for their emaciated figures. And we were conditioned to think that that was the only way that we could be deemed attractive is if we had no fat anywhere on our bodies. You know, there was a girl I went to school with who used to eat on a weighing scale that she would bring in with her to school to make sure that she would watch the scale. And if it went up, she would know to stop eating. You know, you had magazines of famous actresses saying in formal interviews that they were eating naked 
in order to stop themselves from overindulging. This was the conditioning. But at least back then, we had to seek out the toxicity. You had to go and buy the magazine, the expensive magazine, uh, and you had to go on the internet and find, search through pages and pages and pages to find the inspiration accounts or some sort of pro-anorexia websites. Nowadays, you don't even have to be looking for it. You open your phone, it's in your hand, you're alone in the safety of your own bed, and this toxicity pours in via adverts, via other people's feeds. It has, it's, it's just advertising that is finding us whether we're looking for it or not. It's everywhere. And younger and younger people have mobile phones now. I'm seeing two-year-olds when I'm on the underground here using the perfect, like, the two-finger swipe to yeah. be able to zoom in on something. Children are too exposed to all of this. And parents are momentarily really proud when their baby knows how to swipe. I know. They go, oh, it's just instinctive. And yeah. then and then you realise it's actually horrific. Yeah. It's everywhere um, now. It's just, it's it comes up on all of your social media. It's, it's really, like, it's... The most vanity I've ever witnessed in the UK, this was something I, you know, this like vanity and the face tuning, the photoshopping, the fillers and the things that we're doing to our faces and all of these things were something that I always thought would never really exist outside of Los Angeles. But social media has brought it out into the, it's just poured out all across the world and now it's happening everywhere. And I'm seeing my own English friends who used to find this sort of behavior really embarrassing, like posing with their guns, like the, like the, the mirror selfie in the gym and stuff. It's... I'm not judging it, but I am, I'm baffled by it, I'm concerned by it, and I'm coming to an age where I might want to have kids one day, and I'm genuinely afraid for the daughter I might have and what I'm bringing her into, because it's like the Wild West, and there's no policing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the father of a 13-year-old, mm -hmm. um, and so Instagram, the pressures of social media, self-image, mm -hmm. fashion, all of those things are very, very much alive in my, in my household. I mean, would you have been one of those girls who... Who, who was into all of that yourself or were you a... Oh, for sure. For sure. When I was 13, I mean, again, it was the 90s. So, uh, you know, but I, I was very much so affected by it. I was very affected by the interviews and by all of the information I was receiving from every single part of society. Every Hollywood movie I would see, every Disney channel, it was just constant conditioning to see how attractive women had to be and that that was always the thing that was most commented on, most important, if they were ever less attractive or they'd ever gained any weight, or they ever dared to step outside of society's very narrow ideals. They were heavily criticized. I mean, Bridget Jones, if we really look back at Bridget Jones, and I love that movie, and I love everyone involved in that movie, but isn't that amazing that a woman who's 140 pounds, she's a size 12 to 14, the, the overriding narrative of that film is kind Jerry of around fat, her size, pants, and she's yeah. not that big. Yeah. And you look at Renee Zogar, I look at, back at that now, and I'm just like, what was I seeing at that age? I had an eating disorder. I didn't eat a meal between the age of 14 and 17. I didn't menstruate for three years because I was starving myself to fit into an ideal. I was a, a smart kid. I was a scholarship child. I also had a music scholarship. I had all these different talents and gifts, none of which I thought were important, none of which I remotely cared about because I still felt like I would never be good enough unless I weighed six and a half stone. Have you, have you processed that since and worked out why? What do you mean? Why, given all the talents that you had mm -hmm. and the opportunities that you had, you ended up in the situation with, with an eating disorder? I mean, do you understand why it happened? Oh, for sure, because I was bombarded with a narrative that, that had no alternative. It, especially back then, we didn't even have the Lena Dunhams and the Amy Polars and the Kristen Wiggs. We didn't have, at least now, we're starting to see Ashley Graham and, and these plus-size models like break out into the mainstream. I was only, I, there were never any women who were celebrated for their intellect. They're not given any attention in the press. I wasn't reading about wonderful astronauts or scientists or great musicians. I was just seeing highly sexualized pop stars who were very, very skinny on my TV, or I was seeing skeletal actresses who were obsessively, their weight was obsessively spoken about, and all of my magazines were selling weight loss products or telling me to be thin. So Otherwise, you, I wasn't worth anything. So you do think it was ex it was the external pressure for sure that made you. It wasn't just some. It wasn't just something that you no. went through because that was in you. No, no, no. And a lot of eating disorders, a lot of anorexia nervosa, can come from like control issues or, or something that you've even perhaps like inherited a behavioural problem from a parent. But this really did come, and I believe a lot of it does come from the external. And I I broke my back at seventeen, and that changed my relationship with my body. It probably saved my life otherwise until I'd probably still be anorexic now. But it, uh, it forced me to change my relationship with my body and I also gained a lot of weight and I learned how to appreciate this body that I realized back by then that I'd taken hugely for granted and I'd been actively hurting for so long. How did you break your back? I got hit by a car into another car. 
Um, and that sort of knocked, literally knocked some sense into me. But without that, especially now I've seen how the toxicity has grown and how it's spread further and it's kind of come right into our periphery, you know. And also back then, it was just celebrities who had that kind of pressure to look a certain way. But because of social media, it's even the playing field and now it's everyone. It's everyone. And everyone's got access to um, airbrushing. Airbrushing, which I think is one of the foulest things to have happened to women uh, in the last couple of decades. Not ever. So do, do you think of yourself as at all part of that celebrity culture? Because particularly when you were doing T4 and Radio mm. 1, mm -hmm. you were swimming in that sea, weren't you? you oh, were for sure, for sure. And I think I wasn't really, I was feeling very uncomfortable with how I was being portrayed. And I'd sort of been like, I sort of inherited without asking for it, Alexa Chung's sort of aesthetic. Because you took over from her. I took over from her and her job, but I was never really that interested in, I didn't know anything about fashion, which you can tell if you saw any photographs of me for the first three years of my career. Like I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I was more interested in comedy. I was always more interested in comedy, but I was just kind of pushed into that direction. And that was also amazing. And I, you know, it was something that I learned a lot during doing and, and I made some very nice friends, but really that wasn't really who I was. And I felt uncomfortable with it. I used to always ask about not being airbrushed. It was always something that I, I've always felt conscious, but you don't have a lot of power in this industry. And really up until this whole Time's Up movement, I haven't had that much power. People haven't really listened to me. This is a male dominated industry, even the fashion industry. On every photo shoot, it's predominantly men. On every film set, predominantly men. There aren't a lot of women in tech. There aren't a lot of female camera people. So there aren't a lot of female photographers. So I have felt very cornered for my whole career, really up until the last year or so. And so now people are listening to the same thing I've been saying all along. People have made me look white in so many of the magazines and campaigns I've shot for. That hurts me. That hurts me from a cultural point of view. People change my nose to make it look like a little white, like a little Caucasian nose, and they've changed the color of my skin to make it lighter and to make me look more acceptable, perhaps, to a Caucasian audience. I, I, it hurts my feelings. Airbrushing and changing my ethnicity is, is bad for my mental health. It's not just bad for the mental health of the girls who are looking at it. It makes me dis then dislike what I'm seeing in the mirror. It makes me, it sends a direct message from the editor to me and from whoever photoshops my image to me that I am not good enough as I am, that the way I turned up on that set that day wasn't good enough. It's dangerous for the, for the women in this position as much as it is for everyone reading it. It's hurting oh, And when that's us. happened to you, I mean, have you just discovered when you've seen Yes. The magazine. I mean, yes, they, they you're not given approval. Like no, no, you have no idea what photo they're going to use. You're not given any power. You have no autonomy. Only now do I have some sort of autonomy. And I'm going to use it as much as I can and take as much advantage of it as I can to try and never be part of the problem that really destroyed my teen years. Because Lena Dunham spoke out about that. Obviously, yeah. About photo mm -hmm. and, and is it still happening now, do you think? What? That Photoshop. kind of... Yeah. Of, of you and... Not of me. No, so people I, don't dare do it now because you've spoken Yeah, out. no, I can't. Um, I think outside of maybe, I, I suppose if I'm working for a TV company and they make a poster, I don't really have any power at all over that. I don't even know when it's coming out. But anything that is mine that is about me and is just mine and about me as a person, nothing is touched, nothing is altered. If I've got spots that day, deal with it. If you have a problem with the way that I look, that is your problem, not my problem. I am... I'm practicing self-acceptance. So why did you go into the business? I mean, what, what was it you were seeking? And well, how did you get there? I, uh, I was told it was a thousand pounds a day. <laughs> um, I was an English teacher and I uh, met a producer in a pub uh, called The Green Man on Oxford Street. Uh, and he thought I was funny. And he said that there was this job going to replace this young journalist called Alexa Chung and that they'd been doing a nationwide search and um, I should go along for it. And he just gave me the little email address that you send your cover letter and showreel to. I didn't know what a showreel was, so I just sent a ridiculous photograph of myself looking very silly with a letter. They asked me to send in a video. I sent in a video. They asked me to come in. And two weeks later, I was on T4. I had no desire or um, intention to enter this industry, but it was very well paid. And as a young English teacher, it seemed very desirable to me. And I thought I'd get, I never thought I'd get it anyway. I just went along to the audition because I thought it'd be a funny thing to tell my friends about. And then I got it and I kept my job as an English teacher for the first eight months into doing T4 because I was so scared that, I'd, I was so sure I would get fired that I, um, I was teaching Monday to Friday and then I was live on T4 on the weekends, which is very weird for my students. <laughs>
But obviously it went really well. And, yeah. you know, you got promoted and you got mm -hmm. other opportunities and you got the, the Radio 1 mm -hmm. chart show. And that was groundbreaking in, in its own way because you were the first woman to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but then you turned your back on it. Why? Why? Well, I had an amazing time doing it and I had an amazing... I was given so many amazing opportunities here, but I... A couple of different factors came into play around the same time. One of them was that I was starting to realize that this, I love England, I love English television, but I still find it quite narrow in its diversity. And I, I still find it quite narrow for women. I think maybe that's slowly but surely starting to change, but uh, especially in the time that I came up, it still felt like once you go over 30, the opportunities start to really, 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 um, Lesson. Do you mean diversity in the really like in diversity the true when it comes not, to not just, just like not white, not just not just black and white, not just the fact that I, there aren't that many, there still aren't that many uh, Asian youth TV or mainstream entertainment presenters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, and uh, on television, it's 2018, and we have such a huge Asian uh, population in this country. Um, but uh, it was also women of a certain age or women of a certain size. Like I just wasn't seeing a lot of diversity. And every time I was going over to America to do jobs for T4, I was turning on the TV on Good Morning America and you were seeing women in their 50s hosting these big shows and they were curvaceous women and they were you had black women and Asian women and, and, um, and you were seeing all of this you're just seeing human beings. You were seeing that, oh, there isn't like, I'm not gonna be sent off. I would, people don't get sent off to the glue factory over the age of 35 here. And you're not just being known for like rear of the year and some of the ways in which we do sometimes still put women in a very small pigeonhole here. So I think I was starting to, I loved Radio One, but when it came to television, I was starting to wonder where my career was going to go here. And I was having doubts for a while, but I lived in like an obvious fear of I don't want to leave and everything that I've built here and have to go somewhere and start again. But I found a, a well, a doctor found a lump in my breast. And uh, there was a, I think like seven days before you find out the result of the biopsy. And in those seven days, I, I spent so much time pondering whether like, if this is cancer, have I done everything that I wanted to do? Am I fulfilled? Am I happy? Did this lump appear? Because I think there's a, I believe that disease is sometimes dis-ease. I think it's a way of your body sort of um, manifesting like a physical reaction to the fact that you're not actually happy, or you're not doing the right thing that's for you. You're perhaps stressed or, or living your life in a way that isn't most, that isn't best for you and doesn't meet your needs. And so I started to think about whether or not I, there were things that I would regret if it does turn out to be cancer, things that I would have wished I'd done. And if it isn't cancer, I'm gonna go and do those things. And one of those was to move to America live in America for a while, even if it was just for a year, see what happens. And to do what? Uh, what was the dream? I wanted to be a writer. I've always wanted to be a writer. And I'd written a column for Company Magazine and for Cosmo for eight years in the UK. And I just thought I'd like to travel around and be a writer and, and not have pressure to look a certain way and, and not have to compete in an industry that had started to feel quite toxic for me, especially as a woman, especially as a woman of color. Uh, and so I really didn't have any plans or desire to be on television. So you thought you were getting out of the whole thing. I thought I was getting out of the whole thing. I was like, I'm just going to be, be a writer. Yeah, now I'm yeah. an actress in Hollywood. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to get away. I wanted to explore. I, I took a gap year. I didn't do any work. I fell in love and I went traveling around the world with a, a lovely man and had a great time. I did what my, what clearly my body was crying out for me to do. It was relaxed. I, it turned out I didn't have cancer. So I booked a one-way ticket to Los Angeles. I walked into Radio 1. I explained how I felt, they were so supportive and wonderful and said that the door would be open to me if I were to come back after a year. And I left, I left with no contacts, no visa, no idea what I was doing and uh, took a year off. And my mental health has become so much more stable. I've, I've benefited so much from that. I'm so lucky that I'd made enough money to be able to have the luxury of doing that. I'm aware that very few people ever get to do that. And um, I figured out who I was, which I think you don't always have a lot of time to do, especially in London because there's so much chaos. Where did that ability to just kind of go for it come from? Was that something your parents drummed into you or? No, that's Because, you know, you've just done it, you know, you did it go getting into television and mm -hmm. then you did it again when you went to yeah. LA. It's a life lived in the deep end. It's just kind of thinking, well, I can do this, so I'll do it. It's two things. One of them was walking across the road one day and being hit by one car into another car and not being able to walk again for a year. There's something about that that gives you a sense of like, uh, it takes away your ability to take life for granted. You do become a little bit more aware of your mortality and aware that time is running out and you must make the most of every day. So I think I did 
become one of those intolerable people who tries to live life to the max all the time. So that had a huge impact on me and um, gave me so much perspective around life. And the other thing is I read a book by Danny Wallace called The Yes Man about a man who decides, who's in a deep depression, who decides to start yep. saying yes to every opportunity. And that book just had a profound effect on me. And I said to Danny Wallace that I probably owe him a uh, commission for the... For your life. For my life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because he's had such a profound impact on it. And I became more open-minded and became very open to risks. Because sometimes you could be taking no risks and you could just be walking down the street and something absolutely insane can happen to you. Or you can have a lump somewhere in your body and that lump can be cancerous. We have so little actual control over what can happen. We read about all these things in the news all the time, these freak things that occur. So you may as well try to spend every day doing something that makes you happy and makes you feel good if you can, if you are lucky enough to have any morsel of opportunity to do that. Because you, I mean, you've mentioned um, the accident, um, but you had other health issues as a child that you had to mm -hmm. overcome as well. I yeah. Mean, were, they, were they significant in sort of forming who you are or were they just things you lived with? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I, uh, I couldn't hear really until I was 12. I had to have, I think, seven hearing operations. Um, between birth and the age of 12, because I would constantly lose my hearing completely in both ears and wonderful, talented doctors would sort of piece back my eardrums together and use grommets and all sorts of different contraptions inside my ears to help me be able to hear. But I had to go to a special needs primary school and um, where we had carers and there were children with all kinds of uh, different types of disabilities who were there within that school. And I think that really shaped my feeling of perspective and care and empathy once I was able to, after I'd gotten better, I left with a real sense of responsibility to make sure that um, I do as much as I can for people with disabilities. So I do a lot of work within like activism around disability and trying to bring more people with disabilities into the forefront of this industry and also make sure that uh, I set up a company called Why Not People around making sure that people with disabilities can uh, enjoy events. Because uh, you wrote a piece on your blog, didn't you, about yes. sort of observing yeah. how few disabled people you saw yeah, out at in your life. And out, and out and about and how terrible access is still, how embarrassingly awful access is. And, you know, I've gone around the entire country talking to different vendors and, and owners of different establishments, and they've always given me the same pathetic excuse, which is that they don't have enough clientele to justify the costs of changing the building. It's like, well, if they can't get into the building, then you're not going to have the clientele. That's a ridiculous excuse because we persuaded ourselves after the 2012 paralympics mm -hmm. that things had really changed oh yeah yeah towards disability yeah um and a lot of people cautioned at the time just be careful yes and, but, and we're still seeing a lot of the same old issues yes and i i think that's always like why i i feel the need to sometimes keep the conversation going it's why i can sometimes be uh, very vocal on social media constantly about things that, you know, yeah, we already spoke about this six months ago. It's like, yeah, but we have to keep the conversation going to make sure that change actually occurs. How, how do you get over the negativity on social media then? If you're an activist on social media, mm -hmm. um, how do you ride the waves of negativity and abuse and whinging and exactly that kind of thing? You do something positive and people go, oh, we spoke about that before, your old news, you know. Yeah, I've had uh, a lot of people criticize me uh, recently about all of my I Weigh campaigning for saying, not a lot of people, just some people saying that um, I'm doing all of this to further my career. And it's like, do you have any idea how much more money I would have if I were willing to be a double agent for the patriarchy and I would sell these weight loss, like diarrhea teas or whatever it is that everyone's selling now and all these weight loss gummies and flat tummy lollipops. Like, I would have loads of money. I'd own 10 houses. I'm definitely not, or I'm arguing about film directors who are casting known convicted abusers. Like I'm definitely biting the hand that feeds me. I'm not doing this for... For my benefit, I'm well, doing this. What because do you mean it's by double little... agent for the patriarchy? Because that's a phrase you've used before, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I'm going to be careful about this. Don't just don't say to... what you think. Okay. Well, <laughs> I think it's a danger. I think it's dangerous when a woman is never allowed to pull up another woman to criticize another woman, and that woman is then called a bad feminist for ever criticizing another woman, no matter what that woman does. It's like she's a woman; she can choose whatever she does. She's allowed to do anything she wants. Now, that is a wonderful concept and idea. But if a woman is doing something that is damaging to other people, then that is someone who still still should be 
spoken to about like that Kim thing. Kardashian. And criticised, like Kim Kardashian. Wait, who you famously had a go at. Who I did have a go at, not that famously, but uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, I have had words with the Kardashians. And I think when someone is doing something that is toxic and damaging to the people who they have a huge platform and they are speaking towards loads, they are speaking to loads of people, that person is saying something that is dangerous. We should all be allowed to say something about that. I don't think you can just attack that person. I don't think that helps anything. But, but I you think you have to offer you constructive was, criticism. I mean, you said she was a toxic influence. Yes. Now, as a father of a 13-year-old yeah. again, I, I would tend to agree. Yeah. Um, what did you mean by it? So, so the double agent for the patriarchy is basically just a woman who perhaps unknowingly is still putting the patriarchal narrative out into the world is still benefiting off, profiting off, and selling a patriarchal narrative to other women. But it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, just because you look like a woman, we trust you and we think you're on our side, but you are selling us something that is that really doesn't make us feel good. You're selling us a, an ideal, a, a body shape, a, 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 you know, a, a problem with our wrinkles, a problem with aging, a problem with gravity, a problem with any kind of body fat. You're selling us self-consciousness. The, the same poison that made you clearly develop some sort of body dysmorphia or facial dysmorphia, you are now pouring back into the world. You're like recycling hatred. And I find that really dangerous and I think it's unacceptable and I don't care if you're a woman. I think constructive criticism is needed for us, for anyone to ever evolve. For our gender to evolve, we need some sort of constructive uh, criticism as long as we do it in a somewhat careful way. But money is a great um, magnet, isn't it? I mean, you mm -hmm. said yourself, you got you started doing T4 because somebody said, yeah. here's a lot of money. Absolutely, so but I wasn't see hurting anyone happens. by saying, here's Hollyoaks. No, but what I mean is you, yeah. you can presumably see how any person can be seduced into going along with something that if they stopped and thought about it, they'd go, well... Of course dodgy. I do, but so many of the worst things in the world have happened motivated by greed, and I just don't think that's an acceptable excuse anymore. How much, how much money do you need? Really, how much money do you need? How much money... Do, does, do any of these like huge influencers who are worth millions or billions sometimes, how much more, why are they still promoting appetite suppressant lollipops to young girls? And it's not a fight against obesity. They have young, already slim girls in their adverts for Flat Tummy Company, or Flat Tummy Co, whatever they're called now, this company that are absolutely everywhere and they're even being advertised in some of the most mainstream magazines, women's magazines, and they have a billboard in Times Square. Like, why are these people who are already millionaires, how much more money do these people need? What, like, they're, the money is built on the blood and tears of young women who believe in them, who follow them, who look up to them like the big sister they never had. It's just, it's so upsetting. It feels like such a betrayal against women. And I will not be a part of it. I, and I will not stop calling it out when I see it. They will have to run me out of this business, which I'm sure will happen. Um, and but I would rather go down in flames than stick around and be part of this. So when you, when you went to LA, you, you suddenly find yourself mm -hmm. being suggested for this TV show mm -hmm. and you, you've now got into acting. Mm -hmm. um, how, how much of a surprise is the industry? And not the fact that you're doing it, but I mean, is it, is it what you thought it was? Well, I thought, As a journalist. I was, for sure. I mean, I only went to the audition because I wanted to be a writer and Mike Sherb was going to be at the audition and I just wanted to meet him because he's such a hero of mine. Um, I never thought he would cast me as an actress. I, I you know, I, I didn't have any credits. I didn't have any experience. Uh, and yet he did cast me in the show. So I came into it kind of not needing it. So therefore, I, that really benefited me that it was a kind of surprise to me and I got to just enjoy it for what it was. I didn't feel a pressure to conform to anything. I had been offered a job based on what I already was, which was such a gift. And therefore I was able to just be myself and enjoy myself. I didn't feel the pressure to lose weight. I, I was surprised by what I saw in the industry, which is how little anyone eats, what people really look like in real life. Did, it's not like they do in the magazines. Did you make that character or was that character already you know, written like that? I think it was a collaboration. Um, I definitely made her even more annoying and passive aggressive uh, and brought more London into her. I think Americans have quite a, um, a glossy ideal of what English people are like. And so I had to like pour more of the London socialite into her, which I'd experienced from DJing here for big fancy parties for eight years. But you, you've been there through the whole Me Too, mm -hmm. I don't know, what, what is it, a scandal, a fiasco, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, um, movement. Movement. Um, I mean, presumably, as an observer, you know, as, as an entertainment journalist, you, you kind of knew that all of this stuff was going on. You weren't mm -hmm. some engineer who arrived, you know, uh, not knowing what was going on. So, I mean, how, how have you seen it? God, it was brilliant. It was so brilliant to be uh, there in that moment and to 
to see how fast the dynamic in every single room you walked into shifted. It's so powerful what these women have achieved with Time's Up and with Me Too. Um, and you was the first time you were hearing everyone's stories and women in, in dressing rooms weren't competing with each other. They were just sharing stories and, and being so loving and supportive to one another. It's definitely built more of a sense of community and sisterhood amongst women in, in a, what is, has always been a notoriously very catty industry where, you know... Did you always... see that side of us oh, as well? for sure, for sure. I've been doing this for 10 years and um, because women are always made to feel like there can only be one. There can only be one female rapper at, the, at a time and, and if another female rapper comes along, the main rapper, the queen bee rapper has to rip that other one to shreds but we can have countless male rappers who are all doing the same thing. Um, and so that that mentality bleeds out into every single, even when I started in this industry, the, the headlines at the time were move over Alexa Chung or move over Makita Oliver. It's like, why can't they just like, why can't I just stand next to yeah. them? Why do I have to knock them over and put them in the bin? Like, let's just all get along. So women are sort of set upon each other um, in this business. And that has, that has created a sense of fear and that fear externalizes as really catty behavior where we just feel like we need to rip each other down to get into that one space that we've been allocated, which is ridiculous and coming to an end, I believe. Um, and so what Me Too has done and Time's Up has done is made us all realize that we've all been treated really badly and we've been suffering. And even if we haven't been sexually assaulted, we've been emotionally assaulted or we've been um, underestimated or demeaned or undermined and we've been spoken over and spoken badly to, and there is a sense of real solidarity where we realize we've been divided and conquered. And now it is only together that we're going to be able to make a real change and protect the next generation of girls. And so the men behave as if they are slightly afraid of women now and men shake my hand, they don't try and hug me. No one asked me for a follow-up meeting uh, at 9 p.m. at Soho House. And they did before. Oh yeah. And um, the way that men speak about women uh, has changed and there's less crude behavior, there's less crude talk, there's less of me being explicitly told that I can't do something because girls aren't funny. That's something I was told in England. Uh, that like, oh, you know, you just do the fashion stuff because, you know, girls aren't, girls just aren't funny. And I'd have writer's rooms who were just all men, six men, no women, when I would do stuff on television. And so I had no one to write for my voice. I would just stand there and be the part, the sort of segue item. Uh, and so it's, there's, a, there's, there's a hunger for female creators. Uh, you know, the creator of Fleabag is now someone that everyone is looking for, Phoebe Waller-Bridge and uh, Tina Fey, Lena Dunham, Kristen Wiig, women who create their own content are being encouraged. I think the tide is really changing. Does it matter then if the men mm -hmm. have got away with it? The men who were doing this? What do you mean? Well, a lot of, a lot of the men mm -hmm. are still working, carrying on as if nothing mm -hmm. very much happened. A lot, I mean, I still think that we need to continue the momentum of the Me Too movement. There has been a slight feeling of that, well, we did that. You know, we, everyone wore black to the Golden Globes, everyone wore the Time's Up pins. We made a big state about it. Harvey's gone, so we can all relax. I do believe there are still some people, many people who probably need to be called out. But I do know that even those people who perhaps did bad things before, are no longer able to continue that form of bad behavior. They are now, they now know that they're gonna to have to rein it in and learn how to respect this gender. Is that good enough? I mean, that, that's, the, that's my question. I mean, is it, is, it, is it good enough for men to change their behavior and carry on? Or does there need to be more accountability? I mean, you know, no, nobody's, well, not nobody, but relatively few people have lost anything as a result of this mm -hmm. when it comes to the men. Mm -hmm. No one's gone to jail yet. Yeah, which is astonishing, isn't it? So many rape claims, nobody's been to jail yet. Um, I think that not enough has been done yet to reprimand those who we know have abused women, who there is just, there is so much proof, so much evidence against these people. We can't work with people who have hurt women, who we know have been convicted of, or who've been like, who there is so much proof against have hurt women. We cannot work with those people. There are so many people in this industry. You go to Los Angeles, every Uber driver, every waiter, every person who works in a shop is a young actor. There are loads of people who I believe haven't hurt women. Why don't we give those people jobs? Why are we giving the same routine abusers job after job after job at the height of Hollywood? And are you careful um, about what you say and who you name and who you call out? And... No. <laughs> Have you been on my Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not careful at all. Um, I should probably be more careful. Do you careful. get told off? Uh, I... No. I'm, I'm represented by 
male and female diehard feminists. I don't really get called out. And I, I don't speak out of turn and I never say something that isn't proven. I'm very careful. I also have to be careful legally to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. And I'm I'm not doing this for attention. I'm just trying to make sure that we are we have our eyes open. There's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors within this industry that bleeds out because Hollywood and media has such a huge impact. It bleeds out onto society, which bleeds into culture. Has Hollywood turned out to be as um, as diverse as you thought it was when you when you when you wanted to go to America? in terms of the way people view you as a South Asian woman. Mm -hmm. um, it, it feels like it's moving that in that direction, very much so in the last couple of years. It's actually harder to get a job uh, from what I'm hearing from my Caucasian friends. Really? <laughs> as, yeah, uh, for many And are there other roles. women like you? I mean, you know, in Britain, mm -hmm. there aren't many yeah, no, South Asian women in your position. Yeah, diversity is, is still uh, something I despair of in the UK, but I, you know, I, hope more measures are being taken. It's a shame that you kind of like just have just enough to tick the diversity box. We've got one. Um, that I find very frustrating and upsetting. In Los Angeles, I find that there's much more, you know, I'm on an incredibly uh, multicultural and diverse, like racially diverse television show myself um, because Mike Scher really just believes in representing on television what you see out in the street um, and people of all ages and sizes and backgrounds and religious backgrounds. Uh, and I'm seeing more and more of that in Hollywood. I think that's becoming something that's very important. And the more women that rise into power, the more women who are, who are rising at the film networks now and the more people of color who are rising within the film networks is going to change what is being seen on the TV screen. So I think that that's more progressive in America than it is in the United Kingdom. I think we have a way to go. And how, how do you feel about the kinds of parts that people should get? You know, there's a, there are all sorts of debates about um, whether casting should be colorblind um, mm -hmm. or whether you know, whether you have to be, you know, black to play a black part, white to play a white part, gay to play a gay part, trans to play a trans part. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about all of that? It is so ridiculous how many Caucasian people have played parts that were specifically for people from other parts of the world. I find that offensive. I find it ridiculous. I find it very small-minded and actually, financially really dumb, you know, because there are so many markets that they could have opened themselves up to, which they now realize. Look at the tremendous success of Crazy Rich Asians. What an amazing moment in history for us to realize that, oh, look, you can make so much money from just including other people. It only benefits you for people to see something that they can relate to. You know, I was saying to you in the green room earlier that you were one of the first faces I could see on TV and relate to and be like, oh, wow, he looks a bit like me. It's the first time I'd ever seen that. Not I'd much, seen nothing. No, no. Same color. Sort of. The spitting yes. image. Um, you and Connie Huck, you know, you were my two faces that I saw that I could like cling to it. And it was really only you and Connie Huck and maybe Martin Bashir, but I didn't see that much of him that I had to to relate to. The, boy, uh, the young boy, I forget his name, from Breaking Bad. I'm so glad that a, a kid with actual cerebral palsy was allowed to play the son in Breaking Bad and what an amazing moment that was and how extraordinary he was and now he's now done like gap campaigns and he's modeling and he's acting, he's successful. We have to not, as it is, there are so few doors open to people on the outside of just the very, very narrow confines of this industry. We have to then, we, we can't take away the few roles that are open to them that, that are written for people just like them that they can really, you know, you have to pull from somewhere when you're acting. Someone's got direct experience of that thing. Why are you going to go to someone who doesn't? How is that going to benefit the performance in any way? It's really interesting talking to you because sort of as a, again, as a parent, I sort of, I feel like I kind of want to bottle what you're saying quite a lot of the time and, <sighs> and play it to my daughter, which in a way is what I'm doing with this, with this podcast. I mean, how, how do you think you can apply all the things you've learned to, to help younger girls? I'm in, a, in a big way. I mean, you're, you're doing all sorts of things, mm -hmm. right? You know, you blog and you, you obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're a big figure, but is there something else you can do? I'm, I'm writing a book and I would like to go to schools and speak to young people. I would like to do as much as I can within activism. I'd also like, really like to try and change the way that other people in my position, other people with my platform, the way that they market themselves and the way in which they talk to young people. I would really like to just change our, if I could, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge aspiration of mine um, and who knows if I'll be able to achieve it, but I would like to change the way in which we 
portray women. And I would like to be a part of that conversation. I would like to reason with men about, I would like to not attack men when we're talking about things like consent or we're talking about the way that we value women or we talk about pornography. I would like to do that in an open way. I would like to ha start conversations between the two genders and I would like to really, really affect the way that magazines market women. I would like to make everyone think about advertising. I would like to make everyone a little bit more conscious about mental health. Mental health is never taken into account when we're thinking about marketing and we never care. No one cares about the effect that it has on the young people like your daughter who are vulnerable and they're only learning who they are and they're learning the world. It's important for them to receive the correct and helpful and healthy information. So how do you think we should teach teenage girls about consent and boys? Um, I've just made a documentary for the BBC, for Radio 4, uh, about consent. I think it's really important to change the way that we talk to them in schools and rather than just like a condom on a banana, which is helpful, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think that's as far as the conversation around sex should go and I don't just need to learn about fallopian tubes. Kids need to learn about consent. They need something to combat the extraordinary toxicity that's coming to them via the misinformation on the internet, uh, you know, including the porn channels, how unrealistic pornography is and how unrealistic and how pornography is bled into mainstream culture and into music videos and into films. It's everywhere. Pornography is bled fully into all parts of our culture. Look on Instagram. It's all soft pornography now. So it's everywhere. And then these kids are navigating this minefield without any kind of instruction because it's, a, because it's a taboo to talk about it in schools. It's like, if we don't talk about it, they're not going to know and they're going to make the wrong decisions that are because they are ill-informed by people who don't care about them. People who just want clicks and they just want hits and views on the internet. They don't care about the information they're giving to those kids. So how, how do we navigate that? And how do we as parents, how do teachers, who are obviously just removed? I mean, you know, I suppose you are still, um, something happens between your age and my age, which means that you just become a bit more disconnected from mm -hmm. teenage mindsets. Yeah. So you're still in touch. I'm probably not. And no. how do people of my generation deal with it? I think opening up the conversation. That's the thing we've really learned from Me Too and Time's Up. The biggest thing that happened that changed everything is that we just talked. We started coming out and talking about our experiences. We encouraged other people to come forward and talk. We need to encourage young people to talk. We have to make sure that they don't feel shame or fear around talking about sex. Sex is a very natural, very big part of our lives. It's very important that children talk to us about the way they feel about their bodies. It's very important that we talk to our children about the way that they feel about their bodies. It's important that we don't put too much emphasis on their looks, that we don't say things that are fat shaming or body shaming in any way or make someone feel bad about their height. We don't make fun of children. It's very, very important that we just open the conversation up and make sure that they feel safe to come to us and tell us what it is that they're feeling because they're receiving so much bad information all the time and they've got no way to process it or make sense of it. You cannot leave it to them to make sense of it themselves. We have to be a part of the conversation. You have to talk to your children, even about the things that are awkward or embarrassing or that they seem that they don't want to talk to you about. You, we just need to speak. And especially in England, we are not known for talking about our feelings and that really needs to change. It's very detrimental. Do you think it would be better if teenagers came off social media? For sure. I think social media can be amazing but unfortunately it's being used very badly and there isn't enough policing. It's the first time, I believe, in history where adults are learning from children, where adults are behind children. That's the point children. I was going to say. I mean, the yeah, kids know it's... more than the teachers don't. Exactly. So... It's the first time that I've really witnessed that in my lifetime where suddenly, like, the kids are ahead of the adults and normally adults are supposed to guide you through something and teach you and now parents can't even keep up with all the apps and so kids are ahead of us. That's very dangerous. We need experts who are aware of all the biggest apps, aware of all the biggest YouTubers are and what dead bodies they're showing children on their YouTube channel like that kid, something Paul, Logan Paul? Logan Paul, yeah. Right. Um, you know, we need, we need to be ahead of the game. We need to be ahead of the conversation. They need to be learning from us. We cannot be scrambling to catch up with our kids. I think there have to be lessons for parents, But not your just basic children. advice is come off it, is what you're saying. I mean... I think, or, or be, be armed with knowledge. If we can't get the children, I think there should be... I don't think young children should be on social media. I don't, I don't think you should be allowed until you're a teenager to be on social media. I don't think it's safe. But once you are, you better be armed with knowledge. You need to know what is real and what is fake. You need to know about Photoshop. You need to know about the fact that that celebrity doesn't really look like that. Generally, airbrushing, I would like to be banned. I would like it to be legally banned. I think it's an incredibly toxic, awful, pointless thing. Um, that has really hurt so many women. I was one of the women that it really hurt when I was younger. Um, I think they need to learn about pornography. I think they need to learn that those are actors and they need to see behind the scenes on a pornography film and they need to see the actors talking about it and they need to know about the damaging side of pornography. They just need to, they don't know what's real and what's fake. 
and they need to be spoken to about it so that they can see this, just like we can. We're adults, we can see these things and know that they're real and know what's fake. I mean, certainly as a parent, you, you feel that this is sort of the guinea pig generation and we might look back on it in years to come mm -hmm. with horror. Mm -hmm. um, at, I, oh, at, I'm sure. <laughs> at, at the way we didn't deal with it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But it's not too late. It's not too late. And even I Weigh has shown me how fast you can change people's minds and how fast you can affect change and how fast you can get even support of the, the media are supporting me. I never thought that would happen because I was attacking the media. The media are coming onto my side of things and realizing that actually all I'm standing up for is, is humanity. All I'm looking for is a little bit of humanity in this cold, dead business that affects so many people who aren't even in it. Um, I, I've realized that from the letters, I get hundreds of letters a day from women saying they've just worn a bikini on the beach for the first time in 10 years. Or they, uh, one woman who was about to become mayor of a, a really big town in America wrote to me before the ceremony to be like, um, I'm so proud of everything I've achieved, but I don't actually feel any pride because I feel so worried about how fat I'm going to look on the day. Like, isn't that so sad that this woman has achieved so much and she's worrying about the way that she looks, but that's because society did that to her. You know, I, re I and then this woman, I managed to speak to this woman and I made her make an iWay page. And then she, I, I found a link of a beautiful dress on the internet and I sent it to her. I didn't know this woman. And she wore that beautiful dress and she sent me pictures. And she had an amazing day and she felt very proud of herself. We are starting to change people's minds. People are starting to realize their worth. And that's come from four months of a tiny Instagram campaign. What could we do if we all just took a moment to factor in people's mental health and mental well-being? There was a, a magazine that published a photograph of Queen Latifah. Uh, and it had the words beached whale written across her body. She's on a private holiday with her family. This woman has been successful for 30 years, in both in music and in film. She's a multi-millionaire and she came up in a time where it wasn't cool to be ethnic like it is now, you know, where there was extraordinary, like women of color received the most racism and the most discrimination in the industry in which she made a name for herself is a household name. And I believe an Academy Award nominee perhaps, and she got reduced with all of those things that she's done in the world and what an incredible role model she's been to young women, just to a beached whale. Because in her 50s, she's not a size zero. We have to change the way that we talk about women in magazines because that goes in to the readers. It just sinks in and we are marinated in hatred and self-hatred and hatred of our bodies all the time. Do, do you think you'll come to the point where you want the power your, yourself? You know, you, you should be a magazine editor or a studio boss or a you know, an executive, someone pulling the strings rather than criticizing them? I don't know. I feel like that would then only limit me to one publication. I would like to be someone who writes about, talks about, campaigns about. I would like to continue to make documentaries. I would like to be a part of just informing people because I really believe that information has been the biggest part of my recovery as a human being from any trauma that I've been through. Information has been how I've been able to make sense of things, put things into context and therefore arm myself with the ability to recover. We just don't have any information. We're just bombarded with chaos and these texts and these apps and like these computers and there's just imagery coming from us all the time and news coming from this, this, that and the other, all these different directions. We're just, it feels like everyone's just drowning in misinformation. And I think we just need a bit of clarity and to just arm people with a little bit more information so that they can have some autonomy.